The Okavango Delta is a miracle of nature, a vast shimmering oasis bringing life to the desert sands of the Kalahari. This is Southern Africa's last great wilderness, a refuge not only for every kind of beast and bird, but for the thousands of tourists each year who come to soak up its splendour. The delta owes its existence to the Okavango River, which rises in the highlands of Angola. Every January, the annual rains flood the river, sending its life-giving waters on a six-month journey downstream, first through Namibia and finally into Botswana, where it fans out into the world's largest inland delta. This web of waterways covers 17,000 square kilometres. There's more than enough water here to satisfy all of southern Africa. Yet nearly every drop will evaporate within the next few months. We are talking here of large quantities, of about on average 10 billion cubic metres a year. 97% uh, of which goes up into the air, evaporates. And 3% when we're lucky, trickles out at the end of the delta. Most people will regard that as wastage, but we don't. We regard it Maremi Sekwali works with Botswana's Department of Water Affairs. This is a, a one to one million scale map of Botswana of the groundwater resources potential. He says the delta is fast becoming his country's most valuable resource, potentially more precious even than diamonds. You see, the delta is blue because there's plenty of water in there. We've been very dependent on, on, on minerals for a very long time. The minerals have now plateaued. We can't, we can't depend on them forever. So we're looking at other uh, economic uh, engines of growth, and tourism is one promising one. But the Delta is more important to Botswana, more as a, a unique heritage. We realize it no, it no longer belongs to us. We are now just the custodians. It belongs to everybody. And everybody, it seems, wants a piece of the Okavango, especially Namibia, Botswana's western neighbour. Namibia is the driest country in the sub-Sahara. There are no perennial rivers within its borders, and this is its only inland sea, the Sea of Dunes. Where we are at the moment is in central western Namibia. Uh, we're flying along an ephemeral river. Uh, this is fairly typical of 60% of the country. Uh, this river will flow maybe one, two days of the year, maybe only in hours. Uh, small communities rely entirely on sources from these, the sand beds of these rivers. Take a tour of Namibia with Richard Fry, the Under Secretary of Water Affairs, and you're left in no doubt that this is a country with a water problem. And even there, it's about 350 millimetres. A problem which a few months ago almost saw the capital, Vintuk, and its surrounds run dry. Well, it became absolutely frightening. I mean, as a water manager responsible at a national level, um, the capital and uh, associated infrastructure with the capital, what we refer to as the central areas of Namibia, in fact, three towns, a couple of mining organizations and indeed a lot of small users we had one and a half months of water and i think that <laughs> that's that could be characterized as a, an impending humanitarian crisis and indeed that's the way we viewed it fry and his colleagues flew into action their proposed stopgap was to pump water to the capital from a disused mine 
True salvation, however, was to come from a source much more pristine, the Okavango River. Uh, the proposed new off-take works will be just a little further up on the bend of the river, the inside of the bend, so the scar of the river will keep the off-take clear of silt. Namibia has long intended to draw water from the Okavango, but not for another 10 years. The recent crisis gave it a reason to fast track. The plan was to build an emergency pipeline to tap the water of the Okavango and feed it through a series of existing canals and pipes to the capital, 900 kilometres to the south. The offtake was to be minimal, about half of 1% of the river's flow. You know, one doesn't want to overstress it, but uh, we were on the bones of our backside, so to say. So there's no doubt in your mind that the only real solution was to draw water from the Okavango River? Absolutely, yes, yes. There's no doubt in my mind whatsoever. But downstream in Botswana, they're not so sure. OK, well, Dominic, what we have here is a digital map of the delta, which has... Uh, Environmental consultant Paul Scheller has been monitoring the growing pressures on the delta for the past 15 years, and he doesn't like what he sees. Uh, we'd also have to look at the water points, and then we'd have to look at also the airstrips. We could look at roads, which is a requirement for tourism as well as development of the whole area. And then we can see the actual population pressure on the delta now, if we look at the towns and villages which will all start eventually encircling the delta and then isolating it as a, an entity or an ecosystem. So if Namibia does pipe water from the Okavango River, is that one added pressure on the delta? Of course, it's another pressure onto the delta. We don't know what the, again, the long-term impact of that will be. The Namibians are saying they're taking off 1% of that water. But when we're looking at all of those combined pressures that are now affecting the delta, we don't know if that is one more straw that may possibly break the camel's back. All right. As well as his consultancy, Paul Scheller runs a campsite and tourist outfit in Maun, the jumping off point for trips into the Delta. He's not unsympathetic to Namibia's plight. Beyond the Delta, Botswana is bone dry. Paul knows what it's like to tell a tired, hot and dusty camper there's no water for a wash. They get a bit irate when they come in after a long, dusty drive back from the bush and they now want a hot shower and they turn on the tap water and it sort of dribbles out or there's no water at all and they come and they say, how can you run a camp with no water? I mean, what sort of management is this? And then I always tell them, I said, please go down and look at our river. And they say, what river? I say, exactly. Mound sits at the tail end of the delta. It's a rapidly expanding town with rapidly shrinking water reserves. It relies almost entirely on bore water, supplemented, in a good year, by the annual flow of the Tamlakani River. These days, more of a grassy paddock. It's hard to imagine this place underwater, but I'm assured it does happen. Well, any day now, the water from the Angolan highlands should be making its way under the old bridge here in Maun. The arrival of the annual flood, as it's known by locals, is a huge event. Plenty of money is won or lost on bets, trying to pinpoint the exact time and date of the arrival of the water. It's been pretty disappointing over the past four years, though, and last year, for the first time in living memory, the water never even made it into town. We don't have any water. Our water table's dropping more and more each year. The, uh, the pressure for water is, is greater each year. And we're sort of stuck. We're sitting on the edge of one of Botswana's largest water resources, but yet we have no water. So it's, uh, it's, it's an ironic sort of situation, but it's, it's, it's getting to be a desperate situation for us now. If the situation is desperate in town, it's even more so out here, on the fringes of the Delta, home of the Baye, the Delta's traditional inhabitants. Right, so everybody... 
out here and Lefty will get you organized. Lefty is a polar. He makes a living taking tourists out on the waterways in a Makoro, a dugout canoe. Nice knowing you people. Yeah. Bye -bye. If the delta disappears, so does his job. Talk of Namibia's proposed pipeline makes him decidedly nervous. Yeah, myself, I'm, I'm worried. I don't have a job because my job is the only Mukoro. I, I don't want the people, the, the Namibia, to take the water. Yeah. Wow. For the Baye, the Delta is much more than just a job. It's a way of life. They make their homes, baskets and mats from the Delta's reeds and rushes. They eat fish caught from its waters and harvest fruit from trees along its edges. These people have been following the shifting tentacles of the Delta for as long as anyone can remember. And of late, says Lefty's grandmother, they've been moving an awful lot. It's a major colour. I better to hurry. I better to hurry. Bosom paru. I better to hurry. Bo boy umbara. I better to hurry. Boru coco. I better to hurry. Who enable Torocha? I don't talk of Torocha. Get a tahu near Does it concern you that Namibia may take water from the Okavango River? Runara Kari Kahore Ral Hachilaruna. Runara Bahumani. Giano Bahumi Balita. Barra Chukutalun, Rara Kapuai. Karna di Nunuho. Mana media, but so did me chuka. Diano a cadile ba 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 barakin me jabune ba lutit. Namibia, of course, has done nothing of the sort yet. But such is the emotional nature of the debate over the Okavango that misinformation is rife and the avenue for conflict wide open. And this is why I've been saying to the countries of the South Africa that we, we need to begin to put in, in motion arrangement that will, 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 will remove conflict, because there will be conflict. In southern Africa, water is something worth fighting for. Namibia and Botswana know it, so does Angola. Together, they've formed a tripartite commission, OCACOM, to ensure their joint resource, the Okavango, is shared equitably and peaceably. Across Africa, other nations are doing the same. Where would Southern Africa be in, say, 20 years' time if the water commissions didn't exist? It will be at war. Without the commissions, it will be at war. Look at the Zambesi, eight countries having to share that. It could be the biggest conflict of our, of our life. In the deserts of Namibia, as across the continent, the race is on to find new sources of water. With the region's population set to double within the next 25 years, all the predictions are that southern Africa is headed for a chronic water shortage. As far as Alois Narab is concerned, the crisis is already here. He's working with the Desert Research Foundation of Namibia on one of their newest projects, fog harvesting. Every morning after a good mist, he comes to record the amount of condensation which has been caught on a simple plastic meshed screen and funneled into a bucket. Mm. A good night will yield six litres. Promising, but not promising enough for Namibia to scrap its planned pipeline for the Okavango. Recent drought-breaking rains have provided only a breathing space. We can relax, we can, we can take a break for a year, we can do some more environmental work and we can see what happens in the next rainy season. But we're not out of the wood at all. So what happens if within that one year you don't get the go-ahead from Angola and Botswana? What happens then? 
Well, I'm an official, Under Secretary for Water. You know, uh, we negotiate, I think, very well at our levels between the three states. If, however, the answer at that level were, were to be no, then I'm very sure it would be elevated to a political level. You know, presidents would start talking to one another. It's that important? It's that important, yes, of course. For now, the ebb and flow of the Okavango Delta can continue unimpeded by Namibia. Yet the pressures on this unique wetland are mounting. It's only a matter of time before not only Namibia, but Angola and even Botswana do more than just eye these waters for their thirsty populations. The challenge will be for these countries to work together peaceably and in a way which preserves this great heritage for the generations to come.